In this video, what we're going to talk about is to determine how can we find out if two graphs are isomorphic or not. So let's take a look at the first example. Here, what we might want to check is if two graphs are isomorphic, certainly they need to have the same number of vertices. Well, that's pretty obvious, and here we have six vertices, and here we have six vertices, so that's fine. We also know that edges need to be preserved. Adjacency needs to be preserved, so the number of edges has to also be the same. So if we just count up the number of edges, we'll see here we get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine edges. And over here, if we count these up, we also get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine edges. Okay, so there's nothing immediately obviously wrong with number of edges or number of vertices. So now we might want to see if there's any sort of similarity in the structure that would make us believe that it's isomorphic or not isomorphic. Well, if I look at this graph on the left, when I defined bipartite graphs, I used something like this as an example of a complete bipartite graph. Here we can see that one of the partite sets looks like this. It is this vertex, this vertex, and this vertex. The other partite set looks like this, these red vertices here. We can see that any edge in this graph goes between a blue vertex and a red vertex. So if these are going to be isomorphic, certainly this graph also has to have the same property. And I want to just point out that even though it doesn't look like it's drawn in the same way, it does have the same property. If I think of this vertex, this vertex, and this vertex, and then I look at the other three, I'm left with these three being the red vertices, and let's just check something out. Look at any edge that goes around this outer cycle. Well, it goes between a red and a blue vertex always. And look at any other edge. Well, it goes between a blue and a red. This one goes between a red and a blue. And this one also between a red and a blue. So this one is also bipartite. So now we're starting to feel like, wait a minute, maybe these are the same graph. And in fact, they are. Let me give you the mapping. So here's the map. What we're going to do is we're going to map these vertices to these. So I'll write those ones up top. One, two, three, four, five, and six. And remember, when you write down a map, you want to write down what vertex one gets mapped to. So there's many different ways you can do this. In particular, you're going to need to map the blue vertices all to either the blue or to the red. But they have to go to one of the partite sets. So one can be mapped to B. And then 2 can be mapped to D, 3 could be mapped to F, 4 could be mapped to C, 5 could be mapped to E, and finally 6 to A. Now you might be wondering why is it that I mapped some of these which were blue over to some of these guys which I had colored red. And remember the coloring doesn't actually matter. What matters is that all of these three vertices gets mapped to a set of three vertices which is a partite set. So it, these three, one, two, three, could have been mapped to BDF or they could have been mapped to ACE. But they must be mapped to the block of them because they form a partite set. So what we might want to do is check that this is actually an isomorphism. And rather than check every possible edge, I'm just going to do one example. And I'll leave it for you to check every possible edge if you like. So let's take a look at this edge right here. I'm going to draw it in pink, this edge right here. So that's edge 1, 4. It's an edge of our original graph G. So maybe I'll call this one G and this one H. Okay, so 1, 4, that's an edge. Let's take a look at what happens to 1 and to 4 after you map it. So sigma of 1, sigma of 4. Well, what is that? 1 maps to B and 4 maps to C. So is this an edge, B, C? Yes, it is. It's right here. That's an edge in the other graph. So you can do this exact same thing for every one of the nine edges and show that it is an isomorphism. So we know that this is isomorphic, this G is isomorphic to H. 
All right, so when things are isomorphic, it's pretty great. You just find an isomorphism that works. And by the way, I just want to give another isomorphism that works so that you see it's not the only way to have done it. So let's take, I'm just going to call this one a different Greek letter, sigma. Instead of theta, I'll call it sigma. And again, we're going to have one, two, three, four, five, and six up top. And this time, I'm going to map one, two, three to A, C, and E. And I'm going to map four, five, six to D, F, and B. And you can do the same kind of check using the map sigma, and you'll see that sigma is another isomorphism. Right, now what I want to do is show you another example. This one is an example with some more vertices. We actually have eight vertices in these two, and we have lots of edges. Let's count them up. First of all, over here we have eight vertices and it looks like 12 edges because there's four around the outside, four around the inside, and then four that go across. So that's 12 edges. Over here we also have eight vertices. We have eight edges that go around the outside, and then we have four that go through the middle. So that means that the number of vertices is the same and the number of the edges is the same. And you might try to just start mapping these guys from here to here and see if you can find a map, but chances are you're going to run into some problems. And the reason why you're going to run into some problems is because these are not isomorphic. So if this one is my G and this one is my H, it turns out that this is not isomorphic to that. Right. Now, figuring out why something is not isomorphic is a little bit harder because you have to look for a structural property. You need to look for a structural property that is in G but is not in H. So some property that G has which H doesn't have. So when you're looking for a structural property, it's not necessarily obvious what the property is going to be. And you might need to go through and check a few different things. Well, I'm just going to show you this example so you have a feeling for how these can work. What I'm going to find is a property in this graph here. And it looks a little bit funny. What I notice in this graph, because remember, isomorphisms really care about what the adjacencies are. So if I look at this vertex here, V1, I see it's adjacent to three different vertices. That's fine. Over here, everything also has three vertices that it's adjacent to. So that's not very helpful. But if I look over here, I see, OK, if I choose vertex V3, it's not adjacent to V1. So, so far, these two are mutually not adjacent. And I can actually keep doing that a little bit. I can pick out another vertex that's mutually not adjacent to those two. So far, all yellow vertices are not adjacent to each other. And I can continue and do it another time. So I have four mutually, so G has four mutually non-adjacent vertices. So that is a structural property that's present in G. If these two are isomorphic, the same structural property would have to hold over here. In fact, I want to point out that you can't really add in a fifth vertex that's mutually not adjacent from this set. If you try to make this one a yellow vertex, okay, well, that's going to be problematic because it's adjacent to quite a few of them. It's adjacent to that one and that one and that one. It won't be mutually non-adjacent anymore. So now what I want to do is look at the graph H and show that it doesn't have this property. So I'm going to use the color green over here. And basically, if you look at this graph, V1 looks a lot like any of these other vertices. And if you just say, OK, let's pretend that this is going to be one of our mutually non-adjacent vertices. Now, let's try to add more things into this green set. Well, we can't add V2 or V8 because they're adjacent to V1. We also can't add V5. So let's see what else we could add. Well, we could add V3. All right, now once we've added V3, we cannot add V4 and we cannot add V7, so we're going to get stuck if we, let's take a look, we cannot add this one, we already know that. We cannot add that one, we cannot add that one, we cannot add that one, now we cannot add that one, well that means we can only add V6, and we have a maximum of three mutually non-adjacent. 
So in H, there are only three mutually non-adjacent, and I'm going to write ADJ for adjacent vertices. So basically we just showed that G has a structural property which H does not have. That means that these two graphs are not isomorphic.